always, when we relate to God as our Father, we should mingle both reverence, esteem, awe, trembling, with affection, tenderness, trust, confidence, and warmth and friendship. Knowing that God is our Father is one thing. Understanding how we should relate to Him as our Father is another. In this episode of Light and Truth, John Piper opens Malachi 1, 6-14 to demonstrate how knowing God as Father should lead us to honor Him. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on October 25th, 1987. If God welcomes you into his family, if he sends his son into the world to die for your sins, to open the highway to the heart of God as father, if he then adopts you through faith in Christ, puts into your heart the spirit of sonship so that you can cry, Abba, Father, what are the emotions that God is after in you? Now, the biblical answer to that is not simple. It is complex. It has two parts, at least, not one part. Here are the two parts that I'll mention. First, he is after reverence and honor as our father. He wants us to honor him for his age and strength and wisdom and authority. He's the source of our life. And on him we depend minute by minute. minute. We should revere him and honor him as our father. The second part of our emotional response should be one of security, peace, warmth, friendship, based on his pity and his provision and his care. I think the emphasis today, however, is very different than it was 200 years ago. If you ask a typical evangelical today, what do you think of when you hear the fatherhood of God? I think right across the board, almost all of us would say, he loves me. He cares for me. He guides me. He treats me with tenderness. He forgives me. And when I die, he'll take me to his home and Let me be his eternal child. And that's true. Gloriously, wonderfully, indispensably, preciously true. And absolutely nothing that I say this morning, nor that Malachi says, is intended to diminish the preciousness of that truth. In fact, I hope you can see this. It may not be very plain at first, but it is very true. In fact... What I'm going to say is intended to secure that experience. To send the roots of that experience down so that it becomes an unshakable experience. But isn't it striking that the most famous commandment in the Bible regarding a child's relationship to his father is the fifth commandment. Children, honor your father and mother. Now, very few people today, when you tell them that God is their father, think in those terms that it implies a sacred duty to honor God with reverence and awe. Because he is their father. Now, why is this the case? Why has the term father become lopsided in its emotional impact in our hearts? Not false, mind you. Lopsided. Could it be that for many decades, the ideal of human fatherhood has not been In our society, the ideal of a godly man whose leadership and authority and wisdom 
and strength wins the respect and reverence and deference of his children. That simply has not been held up to fathers as the ideal towards which they should strive. Rather, I think the emphasis in increasing measure has been on correcting the specter of authoritarianism and emotional aloofness characteristic of so many male fathers and abusiveness, which is so prevalent today. So much so have we bent in this direction that I think we have, by and large, lost the central dimension of biblical fatherhood, captured in the command, honor thy father. That does not spring first and foremost to our minds. Of course, implied in the command is fathers, be worthy of the honor of your children. Fathers, be worthy of of the reverence and esteem of your children. Fathers, be the kind of fathers who demand and win from your children both playful affection and reverential esteem. The other side of the coin is that neither in our day has the ideal of childhood in relationship to fatherhood been one of reverence and honor and esteem, and deference. 300 years ago, Thomas Watson, when he wrote his commentary on the Westminster Catechism, asked the question, how are children to show honor to their parents? And he answered in these words, and I think they are biblical through and through, by a reverential esteem of their persons, inwardly, by fear mixed with love, outwardly, both in word and gesture. I think he's absolutely right. That's not the atmosphere in which we live, that we breathe today. Reverential esteem is neither demanded nor given in most families, I would say. Now, Whether this fact is a cause or a result of the lopsidedness of our view of the fatherhood of God, I don't know. I suspect it works both ways. The less we revere God as father, the less his fatherhood awakens in us a sense of awe and honor, the less will our ideal of human fatherhood include reverence and esteem. And the other way around is true, too. The less we as human fathers make it our aim to win from our children respect and esteem and honor and reverence, the less they will have any clue that the fatherhood of God implies such an honoring or a reverence. Well, however you perceive the state of affairs in our culture today, I hope that you will agree with me when you look at verse 6 of chapter 1 of Malachi that what we have here is at least a balancing corrective for those who see the fatherhood of God merely in terms of approachability or care or gentle condescension. Would you not agree the fatherhood of God is brought in to humble the priests, not to comfort them. Would you agree with that? The fatherhood of God is brought in to shock and arrest and correct the priests, not to comfort them in this text. They are despising the name of their father. They are treating his table with contempt And the fatherhood of God is not for their comfort or their security. I am a father. Where is my honor? And I'm sure that's the tone of voice in which God spoke it. If I am a father, where is my honor? 
So the clear teaching of this verse is that it is a sacred duty for all of us in this room this morning who know God as our Father. It is a sacred duty to honor Him as our majestic Father. Now, where do I get this word majestic? Why am I inserting this word majestic in there? I want to show you three ways in which God or in which Malachi, speaking for God, helps us feel the majesty of our Father and thus honor Him as we ought. In verse 6, he makes plain that God is our Father And then in the rest of the text, he shows the inconsistency between the way the priests are treating him and his fatherhood. But notice, the inconsistency is not an inconsistency between ingratitude and a caring father. It's not the point. He is not saying, don't you know that your father loves you, cares for you, sustains you, provides for you. How could you be so ungrateful? That's not at all the point. That's true. It's not the point of the text. The text says, if I am your father, where is my honor? The point is the inconsistency between a majestic father and mangy sheep and broken-legged goats and frivolous attitudes in worship. That's the point of the text. Now, how does Malachi make plain for our emotions the majesty of our father? He does it in three ways. First, He helps us feel the majesty of his authority by using a particular name for God again and again and again and again. What's the name? Did you hear it as David read the text? It's Lord of hosts. Let me just read the text for you. Verse 6, if I'm a master, where's my fear, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 8, will he be pleased with you or show favor to you, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 9, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 10, I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 11, my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 13, what a weariness this is, you say, and you sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 13 again, shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 14, I am a great king, says the Lord. Of hosts. That's no accident. He is a majestic father. Now, what does hosts mean? What do you think of when you hear the word hosts? Well, it means three things in Old Testament language it means armies, it means angels, and it means uh, stars. And so I think if you gather it all together, Eight uses here, 24 uses in the book, 300 uses in the Old Testament. Lord of hosts means I am God and I rule the armies of the earth. They are at my disposal. I can dispose of them as I will and accomplish my purposes among the nations, whether the armies know it or not. Secondly, it means I have at my disposal in heaven an almost innumerable number of of angels. They do my bidding everywhere in the world by appointment and they never fail. Not in one errand do they ever fail. And third, I own the stars. I have appointed the place of every trillion, trillion, trillion stars. I have a name given to each one. I call them for family worship at night. They are my brood. I am your father. Where is my honor? So that's the first way Malachi makes plain the majesty of our father. The second way that Malachi does this is by stressing the self-sufficiency of our father. That he doesn't need these mangy sacrifices, these broken-legged goats 
I see that in verse 10. Oh, that there were one of you to shut the doors. Now, what does that mean? Close the temple. Shut it down. Why? I don't need your sacrifices. I don't need those goats. I don't need the aroma to please me. I don't need the meat to feed me. If I were hungry, I would not tell you Psalm 50 or Acts 17. He is not a God to be served by human hands as though he needed anything. For he himself gives to all men life and breath. And everything. He owns every square foot of this city. He owns every seat in the Metrodome. He has creator rights to all the lake property in Minnesota. This land is his land. From California to the New York Island. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land is his land. And for his glory. And so is every country. In this world. That's the second way that Malachi elevates the majesty of our father. If I am your father, where is my honor? And the third and final way that Malachi helps us see the majesty of our father is in his universal victory over the nations. This is verse 11. Let's read it. From the rising of the sun... To its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Now, picture the scene. He's looking at these priests who are offering mangy animals and broken-legged goats and treating his table with contempt. And he says, don't you see? That one day, not only Israel, but every single people, tribe, tongue, and nation on this globe is going to bow in reverential honor before my majesty and you presume to bring spiteful animals into my temple. If I am a father, where is my honor, says the Lord of That's the truth of the morning. If you know God is your father this morning, you should honor your majestic father. Always. And I don't think there's any exception. Always. When we relate to God as our father, we should mingle both reverence, esteem, awe, and trembling with affection, tenderness, Trust, confidence, and warmth and friendship. And I have been so moved and impressed in recent weeks as I've thought about this that the New and Old Testament not only say that they should be mingled, but that in fact a proper experience of the one is dependent on a proper experience of the other. That's why I said at the beginning of this message I'm not against the tender affections. I'm so much for them that I want to root them so deeply that they cannot be shaken. Let me illustrate some texts just very briefly as we close. Psalm 25, 14. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear Him. Friendship casts out fear, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Cowering fear. Paralyzing fear, hate engendering fear, guilt laden fear, cast out by the friendship of God, but not reverential fear. Here's another one. Isaiah 66 verse 2. Who is the man to whom the Lord will look? Now what does the look of God mean? It means his smile, his countenance, his grace. Who is the man upon whom the Lord will smile? He who is contrite and broken in spirit and trembles at my word. Do you want the smile of God upon your face? That's all I want. 
You want the smile of God and the caress of the Almighty? Tremble when he speaks. Finally, Psalm 103, verse 13. The Lord, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. You want to be pitied by God? You want to feel the compassionate arms just the way a father would, would, would pick up a little Jessica McClure when she comes up out of the well? You want a reception like that from God? Fear him. Tremble when he speaks. Now there is no contradiction here, brothers and sisters, unless it's in your heart rebelling against the one or the other. There are people who rebel. There are people who only want a majestic God. They only feel comfortable when my voice rises to this level. Then am I really preaching. And there and there are others who rebel against that tone of voice with all their might. They want a tender God. They want to be whispered to. They want to be caressed and held and cherished and loved and kissed and smiled upon. And I do too. But I will not present half God. We will not worship half gods at Bethlehem. I will not try to cultivate in you half hearts for God. Whole hearts, whole emotions, whole engagements, whole people. I believe with all my heart what Minneapolis needs is people who tremble with a tender affection for God. Who are bold in their brokenness before God, who fear in their familiarity with the Almighty, who are awed with affection. It is a strange thing. It is not common. You won't find it in the world. The counsel of the world will lead you astray. Come to the Scriptures and find the most precious, deep, satisfy experience of the majesty and the mercy of your Father in heaven. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our series, Love That Makes Us Tremble, with a sermon titled, The Failure of Careless Worship. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.